How much of this EMF, 5G, Wi-Fi stuff is real? Like, like RFK talks about it, like penetrating the blood brain barrier and all this stuff. Is that, is that seriously, is that real? So first of all, there's not been very good quality research on this. Okay. Primarily because Robert O. Becker got canceled back in the late 60s. He was the foremost researcher in this space. He showed that like just radio frequencies back then, which like AM, FM, whatever, mm -hmm. were causing tumors in rodents and all these other effects on cells. And they were doing a lot of studies in his lab on like limb regeneration and things like that yeah. using specific frequencies. And I know you talked about that with Jack. Um, but that research basically got buried after he went on 60 Minutes and his whole entire career was ruined basically overnight. There's a whole chapter about him in that book, The Pentagon's Brain. Yeah. Well, that for that reason, we don't actually have high fidelity research to point to and it, conveniently because they can just say, you know, there's no evidence that it's unsafe. Well, there's no evidence that it's safe. In fact, the evidence that is there would suggest that it's not safe. And then if you combine that with like the fact that First of all, all of these 5G, 4G, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, et cetera, they're all forms of light. They're all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. So like I mentioned earlier, our mitochondria are electromagnetic antennas. They're sensing the electromagnetic environment mm -hmm. to try to understand what is going on in the environment. Is it winter? Is it summer? Like, what does it yeah. look like? How do I survive and thrive in this setting? Well, these frequencies were not present in our ancestral environment whatsoever. Right. Very small amounts of radio frequencies can get through the atmosphere, like very, very, very small. Mm. Compared to what we're experiencing today, like our bodies have no idea what this milieu is because it's completely foreign. And so you can, at the very least, think of it as these frequencies are interfering with our ability to create coherence and to sense the environment effectively. Um, but at its worst, you could see it with directly interfering with mitochondrial function, for example, which I wouldn't be surprised by at all, because if we look at, I mean, blue light, toxic artificial blue light being like probably the most severe non-native EMF we're facing, and then all the rest of them with, that we use for our technology mm -hmm. together, at the same time as not moving our bodies, not getting sun, toxic food, toxic water, forever chemicals, all at the same time, all the vaccine schedule, everything like that. So it's like, it's really hard to disentangle because it's multifactorial, the problems that we're facing. And it's not like if we just fix one thing, everything else is fine. <laughs> right. We really have to consider the synergistic, like the negative synergy between these inputs. And nobody's doing that research because it's not reductionist. It doesn't fit within the model. So there hasn't been any real research since so Becker. No. There's been some sponsored by the FCC, but even in their research, they showed that there are potential harms here. Do you think it's reasonable to, uh, reasonable thing to say that, it, that these 5G breaks the blood, blood brain barrier? breaks it i don't know or, about or penetrates it i don't know what did, well, what did rfk say i don't remember what he said i didn't i don't know if i heard that but it was on the joe rogan he started okay. saying it towards the end yeah i don't remember exactly what he said can but you can you find it steve find a yeah. quote rfk talking about 5g and the blood brain barrier we can we can actually figure out exactly what he said but what i can say is when leaky gut and leaky brain are very closely linked because uh -huh. the the cells that comprise the blood brain barrier are very very similar to the cells that comprise the tight junctions of the gut and so whenever we have insults to the body that are affecting the gut mm -hmm. that also has an effect on the brain and like the permeability of that so right. if you increase gut permeability too much you start to get you know lipotoxins and things like this coming from the microbiome and other things coming from the diet heavy metals etc that should have gone out with the stool, but now they're kind of coming into the bloodstream because of the hyperpermeability. That's also directly affecting permeability in the brain. That can create issues with neuroinflammation. When the brain, the blood brain barrier is inflamed, that can um, deplete the ability of the brain to take up glucose from the circulation, which essentially starves the brain in the absence of ketones. That's why ketones are so powerful in neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration, post TBI, et cetera, because in those settings, the brain is inflamed, so it can't take up the glucose that it needs to survive. And so it will either wither or it can compensate by using ketones if they're available. But most people don't get into ketosis. They don't fast enough. They eat too many carbs mm. um, or they just don't know this. So they don't know to leverage like exogenous ketones, for example, or something like this to help mitigate the effects of head injuries, whiplash injuries, um, or even things like uh, like Alzheimer's disease and dementia and things like this that cause issues with that blood brain barrier. Yeah, I had it. There is <laughs> well, whatever you said about like what you were talking. Okay, let's let's listen, let's listen. listen to what he says. Okay, is uh, does all kinds of bad things, including causing cancer. Wi-Fi radiation causes yeah, cancer. from your cell phone. I mean, your cell phone tumor, tumors. 
you know, that, I mean, I'm representing That's hundreds true. of people who have cell phone tumors behind yeah, I'm, the I'm ear. It. It's always on the ear that you favor with your cell phone. That's true. Oh, um, and you know, we have the science. So if anybody lets us in front of a jury, they, it will be over. You know, we, so what is, what is the number? Because a lot of people, there's yourself, a lot of people with it. They're, they're glioblastomas. That's the kind of cancers that they get. But cancer's not the worst thing. They also, you know, it opens up. Wi-Fi ra radiation opens up your blood-brain barrier, and so all these toxins that are in your body can now go into your brain. Well, how does Wi-Fi radiation open up your blood-brain barrier? And yeah, now you're going beyond my uh, mm -hmm. my okay. expertise. Okay. I, I, but what now we're in your field. There okay. are, there <laughs> are, I'm going to use a number here, and you're going to think it's hyperbole, but, but it's not. There are tens of thousands of studies that show the horrendous danger of Wi-Fi radiation. So it breaks the blood-brain barrier. Yeah, so he said it opens it up. Opens up yeah. the blood-brain barrier. So... That kind of makes sense to me because the cells that are controlling those tight junctions that protect against permeability, they require mitochondrial function to maintain their energy levels and bioenergetics to actually allow those junctions to be maintained. So if we're disrupting the mitochondria in general, it would make sense that you could begin to break down those barriers and increase permeability in both the gut and the brain. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's any specific studies looking at that in humans. There's probably not. Mm -hmm. um, what he did say, though, about the cell phones and the brain tumors, I can actually personally attest to this. I had a client who was a model in like the early 2000s, and she was on her phone for like hours a day for different gigs or whatever. And she developed a tumor right behind her right ear where she always had the phone. And back then, the phones were even worse radiation wise because they just weren't regulated as much, I guess. What year was that? It's like 2001. Oh, shit. Yeah. So it was like Nokia brick phones. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I, there have been some steps in the right direction as far as I am aware um, from a radiation perspective. But she got this tumor in her brain behind her ear, got it removed. Her personality like changed after that, like irrevocably. And she hmm. had like suicidal depression for years. And when they- After it was removed? After it was removed, yeah. And when she and her husband came to me for help, you know, it was kind of like the 12th hour. And so I did what I can to help support her light environment and get her outside more. But it was like, she literally killed herself while she was oh, working with me. God. Yeah. But I even told them, I was like, this is really serious. Like I can only do so much so at this point. So she was point. just super depressed after? Yeah. Super depressed. She was just like, no zest for life ever since getting that tumor removed. Oh my God. So it's fucking insane. People's lives can be ruined, and there's they'll get gaslight by the doctors. Her doctor even said, "Oh, it's probably not caused by that." What do you know about like childhood leukemia, or like kid, like really young babies that get like T cell leukemia? And is there any like what is the consensus on like treatment for that? And is there any sort of like unconventional things like what we're talking about today that you believe can be beneficial to fixing that. That's something I really don't know much about, but I have a friend who has a um, kid that just got mm. T cell leukemia and um, they're going through, they have to like do a bone marrow transplant mm -hmm. with the kid soon. And they've been through all well, tons of radiation. Yeah. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, Chronic regular sun exposure is associated with lower levels of blood cancers and immune cancers. So that would be something like a non-negotiable. You just got to, I mean, kids need to be outside playing barefoot anyways. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about grounding, but when your bare feet are in contact with the earth and your palms, you get free electrons from the earth. Negative charge. Negative charge is what powers your mitochondria to make energy. So so you, when your body is touching the earth. Mm -hmm. Specifically your hands and your feet. When your hands and your feet are touching the earth, it's mm -hmm. going to give your mitochondria more energy. Literally, it's free electrons from the earth. And electrons. Can, yep. And you can look at the studies, and we talked about electrons earlier. That's what powers energy production in the mitochondria. But if you look at the studies on grounding, you can see even 20 minutes of grounding. They do thermographs, so they can show, basically, if there's inflammation in an area, they'll do, like, full body. So they'll show, like, there was uh -huh. inflammation in their face. And actually, fun fact, after a cell phone for, like, a few minutes, you can see the thermograph showing this mm. inflammatory impetus within the face. The tissues of the face are hot. Ground for 20 minutes, everything cools down. Um, so it allows you to maintain healthy redox status, redox being that net negative charge. So if you think about our ancestors, we were always grounded because mm -hmm. any um, material that is natural will facilitate that flow of electrons. So if you're wearing leather on your feet, for example, or hides or whatever, okay. cotton even, um, that all allows the, that electron to flow. But now with all of our rubber soled shoes, our synthetic fabrics and everything like that, we're blocking that electrical connection to the earth. 
and we're cutting off basically one third of the electron supply we're supposed to get. When I think about bioenergetics, most people think about food. Food is only one third of the story. We also have direct um, exposure and stimulation of melanin in the skin by the sun. Like I said earlier, that makes free electrons and free energy. And we also have the third pillar being grounding and direct electron exchange from the earth. We're really only getting one of the three pillars in the modern day from the food, and most of the food is BS anyways. So our bodies are starving to death. And that's actually how I see diabetes. I'm going to go back to your leukemia story in a second, but diabetes I really see as like the body is starving because the tissues, the muscle in general, the, the tissues can't take up glucose very well because insulin resistant. They also can't burn fat or ketones really well either because the mitochondria are dysfunctional. That's like the root of the issue in insulin resistance and in diabetes. And so if your tissues can't burn anything, they're literally just shrinking away. And that's why we see sarcopenia and like muscle loss and frailty being associated with metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance. And the tissues just need food. They need support. But food mm -hmm. doesn't have to be food that you eat. Food can also be sun on your skin and your bare feet on the earth. People don't realize that. Right. And that's also something I want to study in my light lab is that like nobody's looking at these kind of interventions, like just putting people outside in nature under natural light because I'm, it's not lucrative, I guess. It's literally free 99. You don't have to have anybody else's prescription to go do it either. Yeah, that's um, interesting, that connection with the electrons and like yeah. the grounding and the food, like his food is just electrons essentially at the end exactly. of the day, right? Yeah, when you're eating food, you're eating for protons and electrons. Right. Of course, you're also eating for micronutrients that help to facilitate certain parts of metabolism. For example, um, there's like a cofactor in the um, enzyme reaction that connects glycolysis to the mitochondria. It's called pyruvate dehydrogenase. There's mm -hmm. an enzyme called TPP. Um, it's like, I don't remember what it stands for. Anyways, that enzyme is part of like a micronutrient that you get from a diet. You know, how you get your B vitamins, and vitamin C, vitamin A, et cetera, E, mm -hmm. whatever. Those vitamins also play roles in metabolism and stuff. So you are also eating for micronutrients, but first and foremost, you're eating for protons and electrons to power mm -hmm. your mitochondria. And if we think about it in that way, then we can be like, okay, where else do we get electrons from? Well, we can get at these two other areas that nobody else is essentially thinking about or talking about. And then when you think about it in that way, it makes total sense why we're kind of experiencing this energetic crisis as mm. modern humans. Um, but going back to your friend's kid, so, you know, getting into the sun, they, at least the epidemiology would say that that's going to be supportive in that context. We also know that, of course, um, I kind of mentioned this earlier, where depending on the hand of mitochondria you're dealt from your mom, that has implications for childhood diseases. And that's kind of the rub too. Like, and this is also the rub of decentralized science in general. It's like, you have to be willing to take responsibility for what you create essentially.